uh, a little bit past uh, midday and we're intending to talk about uh, practical tips for remote hearings for about 30 minutes. I want to say thank you very much to uh, Eliza for asking me questions and also to um, Joe and Catherine, our support staff, who have helped a great deal in getting us to a position where we are able to do this webinar this afternoon. Mark Baxter, who helped put together the programme. Yes, yeah, so this is uh, one of a number of uh, webinars that we are going to be putting on um, most Mondays and Fridays, although because of the time of year, the there won't be uh, as many as normal because of the bank holidays. Uh, the bank holiday, for example, is Friday, which is a bit unusual, but it's to celebrate the E day. Yep. So I'll remind everyone at the end, and you can also find details on our website and Twitter. But on Monday, the 11th of May, we will have another one of these sessions at midday on mediation and ADR using online technology with Penelope Reed QC, Miranda Allardyce and Barbara Rich, all of whom are very experienced mediators. And then the uh, following Friday, that Friday, we will have Changing the Terms of Trust by Matthew Raper. Um, Monday the 18th of May, for example, I will be speaking on Trust and Human Rights Act. Um, you can find, you'll be able to find our full seminar program. For those of us joining, um, as we speak, I was just explaining that this is going to be an ongoing series of seminars put on by Five Steam Buildings normally at the same time. Ruth, do you know how many people we're expecting? Um, I think that there are a few more, so uh, I think that we will wait another minute and then uh, uh, then kick off. I think people are being actually very punctual um, in the COVID era, perhaps because they have uh, less uh, exciting options than they would normally have uh, for uh, other distraction. Um, well, I don't know about you, Ruth, but I think the idea of online hearings is actually quite interesting. Some of my friends have been saying, I just can't believe you're having Zoom hearings and how does that work? So, um, you know, well, that's something we'll find out during the seminar. Uh, yes. And so um, we could um, uh, let everyone know that there's the Q&A box at the bottom of their screen. So if they want to uh, ask questions during the um, course of the webinar, uh, we they can do and uh, Eliza will pick those up uh, if she thinks that they are um, uh, exciting questions and ask me them uh, if you want your name not to be associated with your question because we are recording and we will publish this on the website then say so in the question that you want to be anonymous and then we won't read out your name should we get going Ruth yeah let's start um, so everybody, this is meant to be a quite informal session. Ruth is, um, well, both Ruth and I have had a number of uh, remote hearings and I'm going to be asking Ruth a few questions about how online hearings work and she'll be providing some practical tips. And as Ruth said a moment ago, if you've got any questions, do put them in the Q&A box. Um, if you want to be anonymous, just say and I won't read out your name. Um, right, so shall we get going? Yeah, definitely. So, Ruth, um, first question, when might a remote hearing be a good idea and when might you actually want to postpone it and why? So I think that almost all directions hearings are likely to be suitable for a telephone or video hearing. Interim uh, hearings are also likely to be uh, suitable for video or telephone hearings. Final hearings may be suitable, particularly if there are no video uh, evidence required, so no cross-examination. Um, might be the trial of a Part 8 claim. Uh, if the there is evidence, then that might still be suitable, particularly for a video hearing. I think if there's going to be evidence, it's much more likely to be beneficial to have a video hearing. Although I do know that some people have got leave to cross-examine an expert by phone. Um, things that are likely to be potentially derailing of a final hearing, so you might want to avoid uh, having one because of the risk of an adjournment during the hearing because things are going wrong uh, might be if you have a particularly difficult litigant in person who might try and sabotage the technology so they can't take part uh, or if you have 
um, a witness who falls into the same kind of category, if you have a witness or litigant in person who doesn't have any technology, I've had a case with a litigant in person who's claiming not to have broadband, um, and um, also if there is a question of credibility in, in the witness evidence, I think it might be, uh, the court might be much less willing to uh, decide to uh, have a hearing where credit is an issue because it's much more difficult to make a decision on um, reliability of uh, truthful evidence I think. And Ruth how do you sort these issues out? I mean are you envisaging if there's some sort of dispute between the parties about how this should go that you would have a directions hearing? Um, yeah how would this be managed? So I have had directions hearings about how to have um, the uh, final hearing. Um, I have also made paper applications and they've been decided on paper too. Uh, the court is expecting a higher degree of um, agreement between the parties and I would really encourage cooperation. It isn't very edifying to have an argument about, for example, the platform that we might be having um, the hearing on. I know that there have been cases where people have had kind of relatively bitter disputes about the platform and I think everyone should just be trying to cooperate uh, in order to get business on if that's possible. So we shouldn't be falling out over a Zoom versus Skype debate then? No I don't think so. No. Talking of that I mean what are the options obviously we've mentioned Zoom and we've mentioned um, Skype um, what's the full list and what are the advantages and disadvantages to the extent you have control? So telephone is available. It's probably only really uh, best to use telephone if people have difficulties with video technology. Why video you say that? Is that just for obvious reasons, really? Uh, yes, I think that people, the judges think that the video hearings are preferable. It is easier to work out who should be speaking next on a video call and you are able better to um, uh, view how the judge is taking your submissions even though it's not as good as if you were in a real hearing. There's also the um, issue uh, of whether you have Skype for business, your court might have a uh, particular preference for a kind of technology so uh, all the Chancery Masters have been told by the chief master to use Skype for business, the uh, Court of Protection at First Avenue House um, have said that they want to use Skype for business. There's more discretion for the uh, Chancery and Family High Court judges. Uh, the full-time judges seem to be using Skype for business, but where you have a part-time judge, you might have to choose the medium yourself and arrange it yourself. Um, my experience has that been that it's Skype for business in the county court, but that might depend on the different county courts. Uh, I know that some people have, like, there has been hearings via Zoom, because you had a Zoom hearing in the court. Had, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's, uh, I know that um, members of chambers have been doing some Microsoft Teams um, hearings, and someone suggested that in the Bahamas there was an opportunity to use something called lifestyle, so other jurisdictions might be using different kinds of technology. There is a problem, however, with Skype for Business, um, which is that it's no longer supported by Microsoft, and Microsoft have allowed it to be overtaken by Microsoft Teams, and in the new update to, uh, for Mac computer users, um, there is a, uh, a problem with the update, which means that it's difficult to connect to the audio on your uh, Mac. So um, beware, particularly in advance, if you have updated uh, your Mac computer and you're using Skype for Business for the first time, you might have audio issues. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think this was something that's being raised with Voss, but um, in the meantime, Ruth, we were talking earlier on about having different devices, because certainly I've got an old iPad that I could use that does work for Skype for Business, um, and I think there are advantages anyway, don't you think, in having more than one device, if you can? Yes, I agree with that. I think that I've been using my iPad as the electronic bundle. Um, um, this may sound quite old-fashioned, but I do think there are some advantages to printing your bundle out, although it may be better if the court isn't printing its bundle out for you to have the same thing as it, so that uh, you know exactly uh, where it's going to if uh, um, it wants to go to something and you have a paper copy that may cause trouble. I've also been using my phone to uh, take uh, instructions as well. 
Mm. I mean, it's a good backup, isn't it, to have a paper bundle, because that might be the sort of thing that causes your computer to freeze or someone's computer to freeze. Um, but I agree that, you know, you ideally you want to be working from the thing that the court is working from as a, as a backup. So, um, Ruth, house party. Uh, any views on that? Can we have can we play games during hearings? <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't myself. I think that uh, house party is probably a no. Um, obviously, uh, that's a possible venue for your uh, post court party if everything has gone particularly well. Um, I think that there is a risk of undue informality in these proceedings, and I've been kind of as careful as I can to. Uh, dress and act in exactly the same way as I would in a, a regular court hearing. That's true. It's easy to make mistakes as well. I mean, I was just responding to our administrator to say thanks for something. I managed to send it to the whole group. So um, it's a good lesson um, uh, in, ch in chat. So there we go. Um, but OK, Ruth, so we've, we've had a battle. You've persuaded me that House Party um, isn't right. We managed to send an agreed directions order off to the judge. Um, agreeing whatever platform what actually happens on the day can you talk us through the steps for those who haven't actually done it before because obviously it's not the same as just sort of bundling into you know court 10 or whatever no absolutely not so um for example um i was lucky enough to have a test skype on one of my hearings so the clerk to the judge sent that out in advance and if you can get a test skype i would uh, really uh advocate using it i've had one um Skype hearing where I got the invitation literally minutes before the hearing and that was unfortunate because you know it adds an additional layer of stress not knowing if you're the only person who hasn't got the invitation and whether there's a hearing going on uh, without you. Um, so what will happen when you um, the, normally the court will arrange the video call and you will um, uh, arrive a little bit in advance uh, in the high uh, in, before a high court judge certainly the judge won't be on the call to begin with you'll see um, the clerk uh, and the clerk will invite the judge when all the participants have arrived that you might not be able to get that kind of level of formality in, in other um, other courts uh, the clerk of the court will then record the hearing that's the most important thing actually for the technology the court is very very keen on um, recording so you won't be able to use the technology form that doesn't record but you shouldn't be recording yourself it's the court that does the recording um, yeah. most of the platforms or in fact all of them I think that we mentioned earlier on they all have recording facilities I and mean, I've had you know zoom recording and so on exactly yeah. um, uh, and so people can join in fact members of the public can join on my first Skype hearing I had uh, someone from Lawtel come on it's wise if you're not a um, advocate to um, uh, take the video off so that you're not overusing the judge's bandwidth uh, everybody should be muting when they're not talking if they don't do that then there are feedback issues um, it's uh, the court clerk will announce the case and the judge will likely say something uh, to begin with and invite the first advocate to speak. It's important, um, even more important than uh, normal, not to interrupt because it's very difficult to manage a hearing if there are interruptions and the court hearing will then carry on um, sort of as you would expect normally. Uh, it's more difficult to um, take instructions um, mm. when you're on the um, video hearing. Uh, I have been um, taking instructions via WhatsApp, having set up a uh, WhatsApp group beforehand, and that's been very helpful. So, for example, I've been able to uh, explain to my solicitor that I have been knocked off the call when I was knocked off a Skype uh, call. Um, and I've been able to get answers to questions. It's also possible to take instructions on a more substantial issue by, mute, by asking the court to essentially rise. In that case, the judge will, um, mute, will mute and get you to mute, and they might go away from the uh, screen, and then you can telephone your solicitor to take uh, instructions uh, that way too. Um, the court will um, give a judgment and finish the proceedings in the sort of normal way. Hmm. 
Um, yeah, Ruth, you mentioned rising earlier on, but I think that's one of the things we're told not to do, to rise for the court. Um, oh, yes, we are told not to rise, but the court might rise. The court might rise. I mean, literally, we're not to rise. Yeah. I mean, and I was just thinking about, um, you know, I've discovered the number of ways that you can be interrupted during a hearing. So I'm ever coming up with all the technology you have to turn off. Um, I've got an intercom buzzer to my flat, so I've turned that off. Um, so I hope I've cracked all of the distractions, but we'll see. Yes, it's very common for people to have their inter their email on. I was listening to a podcast um, yesterday, and uh, it was David Runciman interviewing David Miliband, and David Miliband's email kept going every five minutes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, oh, it does show you know how you know busy you are. But it's probably not a good look. <laughs> um, so, Ruth, if um, for solicitors, what is the best way to prepare for an e-hearing in a way that they would, you know, that, that's different from a normal hearing? Um, so I think doing everything much earlier is a very sensible idea. So engaging with uh, counsel earlier on the bundle, with the other side on the bundle, so there can be an agreed bundle, uh, maybe using a core bundle and a another bundle where so that you can focus the judge's attention on the really core documents and so that will be easier to manage on a PDF. Uh, sending the bundle and other documents including authorities bundles maybe with authorities sidelined um, in advance uh, so that um, they can receive be received by the judge. I've certainly heard of hearings been adjourned because documents were sent late the night before which haven't got to the judge so the judge felt that he couldn't deal with the hearing um, uh, working out if there's any technological problems with the bundle so for example in my hearing in the high court uh, one of the bundles was corrupted but that didn't cause a problem because the clerk, the clerk was able to identify that early she was able to say that the judge wanted a bookmarked bundle um, so that that was able to be put in place. I think um, longer reading lists are likely to be a good idea um, because I found it quite difficult to refer the judge to um, parts of the bundle. I mean, it is possible, but it's not as effective as it would be in normal circumstances. Why, why do you think that is, Ruth? Well, I think it's partly because you don't have the same emotional connection with the judge that you do in the uh, actual hearing. So where, whereas I found it much easier to go for uh, to read out a part of a document and see the judge is with me and he's following and he's appreciating the point. It's much harder, I feel, to get that sort of gotcha moment in a video call. It's also more clunky going from page to page. Uh, it's harder for the judge and it's harder for you too if you don't have a paper bundle. So um, I think I have been extending reading lists. Yeah, I mean, presumably, Ruth, also this idea of the core bundle really helps. So you might have your kind of 10, 12, 20 documents, depending on what the case is, that are absolutely essential and that you know that you'll be taking the judge to. And then everything else goes in your sort of spare bundle or supplementary bundle so that you aren't in that horrible situation that, you know, the judge wants to see something that you don't have there. Would you? Exactly. Would you so in my hearing... Uh, before Mr. Justice Burst, he wanted to see the IHT 400. I hadn't anticipated this, but luckily it was in the main, bu the bun the main bundle, not the core bundle. Um, and so I was able to take it to him, although it did take a little bit of time to find. Um, yeah. And I noticed that in some cases, the court have been directing that bundle should only be 300 pages long. So I have, um, been anticipating this in our witness statements and taking out more by way of quotation from correspondence so that I can include the witness statement but not the backup correspondence if that it's, that's going to cause us to exceed the bundle number. Um, that's the sort of thing that's going to need um, more forward planning I think. Mm. And Ruth, what do you do, say, um, if you're a defendant and you just, or you're a claimant, and you, the other side are just simply refusing to engage with these kind of, all these practical points that you've been mentioning, and you know, your hearing's coming up two weeks away, and you're worried it's going to be absolute chaos, um, how would you actually sort of spur them on or get them into, um, get this thing into some shape, especially if you're the defendant where you have less control? Yes, you do have more control as the claimant. So you could just in the end say, well, I'm going to submit this bundle. I mean, you can do that as a defendant, but it's a lot harder. Yeah. I think having everything 
put in place in correspondence is sensible. So if the case ends up adjourning, then you can make a cost application on the basis of the correspondence. Mm -hmm. um, and if you feel like that's likely to happen, then making sure the court has the correspondence so that you can uh, refer them to it. I mean, it might be difficult if there's a chaotic hearing, but at least you'll be able to show the judge that it isn't your fault. In the end, if the other side are really not playing ball, simply submitting your bundle and letting them submit a rival bundle um, afterwards, if they can get that together, is probably the best solution. It's not perfect. No, no, I suppose that's one of the things um, about all of this, that none of it is really perfect. Um, OK, so uh, another difficulty, I imagine, is actually taking instructions because, you you know, we're used to just being able to kind of turn around and take a post-it note. Um, how have you actually been managing that? You, uh, you know, you've got your two devices at least. Um, so I have been trying to anticipate all the things that I might need ad, uh, instructions on in advance uh, so as to limit the need to take instructions. Uh, I have been using my WhatsApp group with uh, the solicitors. Um, uh, there was some discussion of including the clients on the WhatsApp group for instructions, but in the end, I took the view that it was better for the solicitor to have two WhatsApp groups, one with the client and one with me, so that I wasn't distracted by uh, questions that the client might be asking. Um, you do have to be on your toes uh, to make sure that you are checking your WhatsApp group because you won't want to have your notifications buzzing away when your solicitor is giving you instructions. One thing that I haven't come up with a proper solution to is taking instructions for summary assessments of costs. Mm -hmm. um, my solution to this has been to ask for detailed assessment and payment on account because I think that it's too difficult to ask for all the information that you might need on a summary assessment that the court might ask for in advance because it's essentially what is the basis for everything in this uh, cost statement. And um, I think that it would be extremely clumsy to have to answer that all um, uh, via the WhatsApp group uh, or by taking instructions over the phone after each question. Um, I know that some uh, solicitors have been asking questions directly, but in general, the court has asked people to give instructions and the counsel to speak in the normal way rather than solicitors to interject. Um, yeah. Two points, Ruth. Um, in terms of instructions, I mean, I had a stat will case and the judge actually gave us sort of 10 minutes off. Um, but then that was the only case I think listed in that judge's diary that day. Um, so there's more flexibility. So um, first of all, what do you think about that as you know, a solution to some of these problems? Um, and then I'll come on to the second question in a minute. So I think it's good if there's one particular question that's difficult that you need to take instructions on. Obviously, if you need to take instructions, you should be taking proper instructions. But if you have to ask for a opportunity to, to uh, sort of virtually turn your back every couple of minutes, I think that there's going to be it's going to be less effective than it would be normally in a court hearing because of the sort of disruption to the flow of the hearing which doesn't really disrupt uh, uh, an in-person hearing it's sort of part of the run of the course but it does really disrupt uh, a virtual hearing but obviously it's important to make submissions on the basis of the correct constructions so I mean, that has to be the guiding principle but I would try uh, and minimize or where possible uh, by asking in advance or finding ways to take instructions that aren't um, clunky. Mm. I don't know about you, but I've had the experience, and I think some of our other colleagues have as well, that judges are really trying to streamline, even more so than usual, the decisions that they absolutely have to make. So if there's anything they can push off, for example, detailed assessment, um, then that's what they're going to do. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think that that's another reason to get things in an advance, which means that there's less chance of the court deciding they can't possibly manage to deal with this today yeah by the way to our audience uh we haven't had any questions yet so do, if you have any do ask or you can always um email us afterwards we've got we've still got a few more minutes left though for the moment um just checking my uh, little list uh, so, um yeah pitfalls of remote hearings. I mean, we've spoken about a few interruptions being one of them. I suppose if you've got children at home, there's perhaps only a limited amount you can do with them. But obviously, you know, the technology can try and turn off. What other pitfalls are there, Ruth, and what can we do about them? 
So um, we apparently there is a strategy for dealing with small children, which I don't have to deal with myself. But people have been putting up signs outside the door saying "Daddy in court" or "Mummy." I've seen in that. Court. Depends on how young they are, doesn't it, and how obedient. Um, <laughs> perhaps that's for another podcast. But, uh, Hopefully uh, the judges are being relatively tolerant of interruptions like that because it's a difficult environment for everybody. Obviously there's the tech doesn't work, the tech partially works but it works badly. Um, if you get a break in the hearing then just try and uh, get back on it, let your solicitor know by a WhatsApp group. Um, the same if you're a solicitor that gets pushed off the hearing, uh, if you can get back on it let the council know. I mean hopefully council will be able to see that pretty quickly because because um, you'll disappear off the screen uh, or the participant number will go down. Um, what about it's, unruly participants? So, you know, I'm really yeah, it's not, now. what would you do about me? <laughs> it's much, much more difficult for a judge to deal with the unruly participants because just like I said, that it's more difficult to have an emotional connection with a judge. It's more difficult for the judge to exert his or her authority on that uh, slightly disruptive litigant in person in general um, it, it is um, possible um, just to let them get their rant finished with and say well we've heard that and now uh, let's get on or you could in a really um, uh, really extreme example ask the judge to mute a unruly litigant in person and only demute him or her when uh, the judge wants to hear yeah. So if you were going to summarise the sort of the, the three most important things you think um, about remote hearings, whether it's prep or the hearing itself, what do you think they would be? So, yeah, I think it's everything should be done much earlier in advance and agreed as much as possible in advance. So yeah. uh, stitch in time will save nine. Uh, I think testing I is also... I think um, my experience has been that bundles have just... You know, sp have just proved quite difficult just in terms of like the actual physicality and I think sometimes the courts want you to send PDFs but then everyone else is working from a hyperlinked sort of e-bundle in a different format and then you discover that you know some document as you say has got corrupted in the middle so I completely endorse that I mean you you really ideally I think at least a week in advance if you can be working from the e-bundle to make sure you've ironed out any problems. Yeah. So yeah, early preparation, uh, testing the uh, equipment if you can in advance so you're not caught out by, you know, the Mac update. And the third thing uh, I would say is to try and, I mean, I know it's a major principle of advocacy to keep it simple anyway, but even more so, I would keep it really simple as much as you can with a, with a core message and the minimum you can get away with uh, in terms of evidence to subject, substantiate that that you're taking the court to on the day. And Ruth, presumably that's not only streamlined in terms of evidence, but also what, what you were mentioning earlier on about um, you know, judges maybe not wanting to make as many decisions, kind of a streamlined sort of wish list for decisions that you be made. Yes, so I have been trying to be as realistic as possible about what can be done and what uh, what's going to push the judge over the edge uh, and make him or her decide to adjourn. So I've been trying to be as realistic as possible um, with what we can uh, achieve. So I think that in summary, um, the remote hearings are not as good as in real life hearings, but they are a great deal better than um, no hearings at all. I think justice can get done at most remote hearings, particularly where everyone has a will to, uh, to come and get the dispute sorted out and there isn't someone trying to disrupt the process. Um, I think they've actually gone better than I was expecting. Um, you do have to be realistic about what has to be achieved um, what, and what can be achieved, but uh, you can get orders, you can get interim orders, you can get holding wills, you can get final wills, you can get injunctions, um, and um, you can get final decisions too. Brilliant. All right, so I think we're going to wrap up then. As I said, I mean, if you've got any questions, do feel free to contact Ruth or me or via the clerks about this. Um, and as I was saying, this is going to be a regular um, slot. Um, we're actually starting the next one next Monday um, because the bank hold, oh, for some reason anyway. So we've got Monday the 11th of May, 12 noon, always 
Um, mediation and ADR using online technology. That's with Penelope Reese, QC, Miranda Allardyce and Barbara Rich. That Friday, we've got Changing the Terms of Trust by Matthew Raper. Following Monday, 18th of May, Trust and Human Rights Act cases by uh, me. Um, I'm really fascinated by that subject and how, um, as a judge in a recent hearing, I had said how human rights is encroaching everywhere, even fusty old trusts. And, um, and we will have more um, coming up that you can look in, into. So thank you very much for attending, everybody. Did you have anything else to say? <laughs> Thanks very much, Eliza. It is uh, not next Friday because it's the VE Friday. Back. I knew there was something. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Really. Um, because um, it's uh, Star Wars Day, uh, I thought I'd say that uh, if uh, you do have a remote hearing, uh, may the force be with you. Thanks right. so much for coming. Thank you. Bye bye.